Now, if you have your Bible or access to a copy of the scriptures, I'm going to ask you to join me in the Gospel of Mark, the New Testament uh, Gospel of Mark, the second book of the New Testament. We began a series in this gospel last week, and so we're going to pick up where we left off last week in Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, I'm going to begin reading in verse 14, and I'm going to read all the way to the end of the chapter. This is a little bit longer of a passage than we typically read, but I think it's worth hearing. And so I'll ask you to bear with me and uh, patiently listen uh, to these good words. So Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 14. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him, and going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, What is this? a new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him, and he said to him, and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once, and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priests, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us to join those people that we read about right there at the end of the passage, that we would come to Jesus this morning, that we would bring ourselves to these stories about him, about what he said and what he's done, And that we would come to him not to just learn a new piece of information. That we would come to him not to just get a little inspiration for the week to come. But that we would come to him with all that we are. So that we could be changed by all that he is. And so we ask that you would open our eyes and our ears, our minds and our hearts. 
to receive your word, to receive what you are saying through your son this morning and be changed by it. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. From forth the fatal loins of those two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. Those are lines five and six of the prologue of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. And in those lines and in the double meaning of those lines, including both birth from these warring families and then the nature of their death, in those lines is the whole story, the whole plot of that play. The plot is completely spoiled by those two lines right at the beginning. And so why do we keep reading? Why do we keep watching and listening to this play? Well, it's because Shakespeare's story about Romeo and Juliet isn't about the mystery of what will happen. It's about the mystery of why it happens and how it happens. And we have a similar situation at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. Because everything, the whole story, the whole plot, the whole message of this book is right here in this chapter, and especially in verses 14 and 15. When Jesus proclaims the gospel of God and says the time is fulfilled, the kingdom is at hand. It's all right there. Plot completely spoiled. Because the whole story of this gospel is about the arrival of God's kingdom. It is about the arrival of God's rule, of what he wants for all things. And so if we already know what's going to happen, why should we keep reading? Well, for the same reason we keep reading Romeo and Juliet, it is because this book, this story is not primarily about the mystery of what is happening. It is to immerse us in the mystery of why it happens and how it happens. We keep reading this gospel because we find here answers to questions like, what is this kingdom and how does it come? And so we're going to keep reading this morning, and we're going to let these initial beginning episodes of the ministry of Jesus in Mark chapter 21 begin to answer those questions for us. And even more, an even more important question that these episodes will address for us is what the young English student might ask his teacher, which is, why does all of this matter in the first place? And what does it have to do with our lives? And so let's look at the story of God's kingdom arriving in Mark chapter 1 and see it in two parts. We'll look at the meaning of the kingdom and the method of the kingdom. So first of all, the meaning of the kingdom, what is it? And what we see from the very beginning is that this kingdom means a community. After Jesus announces the kingdom, what's the first thing he does? It is not to teach or to heal. It is to invite these two sets of brothers to join his team, to become his apprentices. And we'll talk more about this community in a bit and in the weeks to come. But for now, I want you to notice that when Jesus calls this group together, what does he call them? He says, follow me and I will make you Fishers of men, and that men includes women as well. Fishers of people. And in that image, in that vocation, is the meaning of the kingdom of God. You see, for Scripture and for the ancient cultures that surrounded Scripture, what's called the ancient Near East, the sea, large bodies of water, including lakes, represented chaos. They represented the mysterious, the unknown, the unformed. And that chaos could have a negative implication. And so these large bodies of water, the sea, it's the place of storms. It's the place of monsters, including spiritual monsters. 
But that chaos can also have a potential implication as well, or good p- potential implication as well, because chaos isn't just negative, it's not just threat, it is potential. It is that out of which order is made. And so when God creates the world, it is initially formless and void. It's a watery chaos, but that's not a negative threat because God begins to call out of that and shape out of that the orderly conditions of life. He makes life possible out of that chaos, which is what a fisherman does. That's what these men did who Jesus called to be his first disciples. A fisherman comes to the chaos. It, he comes to the potential threat and he takes out of that chaos something that is good and useful for life. And that's what the kingdom of God is for humanity. It is the rule, it it is the life-giving order of God drawing people out of chaos and making of them something that is good and useful. And if we don't see that in the image, Mark makes sure that we see it in the stories that follow. And so in verse 23, we meet our first demon in the gospel of Mark. There are a lot of them in this gospel. All of the gospels tell these types of stories, but they are are a particular emphasis for Mark. Why? Because he wants us to see how the arrival of God's kingdom is God's life-giving order confronting and overcoming the chaotic spiritual powers that can grip, dominate, and destroy our humanity. And so when Jesus silences and dismisses this demon, he is fishing. He is drawing this man out of the sea and placing him on dry ground, restoring his humanity. And he does something similar with the two healings that we hear about in this chapter as well. The exorcisms and the healings in the Gospels are different, but they are linked. Uh, We could say something like, with the exorcism, Jesus is liberating people from the oppressive power of sin. In the healings, Jesus is rescuing people from the tragic impact of sin. Because see, when Adam and Eve sinned, they opened God's orderly conditions of life. God's design for life, they opened that order to chaos. They opened that life to decay, disintegration, illness, disease, and death. And so when Jesus heals, he's fishing. He is taking the people out of that chaos that has been created by sin and he is placing them on solid ground. And he's not just doing that physically. In verse 40, when the leper comes to Jesus, he doesn't ask to be healed. He asks to be made clean. Remember also the demon is called an unclean spirit. This is the ritual language from the Old Testament and ritual categories from the Old Testament. And so when Jesus says, I will be clean, and then sends this man to do the ritual so that he can be restored to the worship life of God's people, Jesus is showing us that he is repairing this man more than physically. He is repairing him psychologically, psychologically, relationally, and spiritually. And it's the same for Peter's mother-in-law. Jesus doesn't just take away her fever. He restores her to her place as the hostess in her home, enables her to be who she is and more because her home becomes the connection point to the rest of the city seeking the healing of Jesus. The arrival of God's kingdom 
is the, the arrival of God's rule to fish us out of all of the chaos created by sin and to make of us something good and useful and even beautiful. In Thornton Wilder's classic play, Our Town, it's classic theater day here at Walnut Creek, uh, there is a character named Simon Stimson and he is the choir director and the organ player at the church in the town. He is also the town drunk. So he combines the beautiful possibility of being human and in that beauty ruined by the destructive force of addiction. And he's very cynical and despairing and he says at one point in the play, he says to be alive is to move about in a cloud of ignorance to be always at the mercy of one self-centered passion or another. It's a pretty cynical, despairing view of life, isn't it? And you know what? To be alive can be like that and worse. But the meaning of the kingdom of God is to say that life doesn't have to be like that. The kingdom of God says there is a better way to be alive. The arrival of God's kingdom says that we can be alive free from our self-centered passions, free of disordered desires, free of destructive spiritual powers, that we can be alive, not all the way there yet, but becoming, moving towards the beauty that God intends for us. The kingdom of God, like a fisherman taking a fish out of the sea, arrives to fish us out of what would destroy us, disintegrate us, and to make of us something good, useful, and beautiful. So can you see why his kingdom matters more than anything else? Can you see why Jesus would say in another gospel that we should seek that kingdom, pray for that kingdom, desire, pursue that kingdom above all else? Is that your desire? Is that what you were seeking? Now maybe you think that sounds like a really nice idea, but it also sounds really unrealistic. And so we need to ask how, how does this kingdom come? How is this mission accomplished? Consider secondly, the method of the kingdom. How does the kingdom come? When Jesus encounters this first demon in the gospel of Mark, where is he? He's in the synagogue, right? And what happens in the synagogue? Well, the synagogue was the place where the people gathered to hear the law of God discussed, debated, and taught. And when the people gather and hear Jesus do that, they intuit that something new is happening. They intuit that he is teaching, not like the scribes, not like the other people they've heard, but he is teaching with authority. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to, for Jesus to teach with authority? Well, he shows us what that means by silencing and dismissing the demon in this man. See, what was, what was the law of God? The law of God was God's orderly design for what life should be. It's an expression of the, of the ideal, the, the desire for God's kingdom. And so God rescues his people out of oppression, out of oppression by Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt. It's a kind of exorcism. He rescues them and brings them through what? Through a large body of water. He brings them through the sea on dry ground, see the image, and then he meets them at Sinai to make of them something good and useful to draw them towards his design for humanity by expressing what he wants, how he wants them to live their lives, how he wants them to relate to one another. The problem is that the law only expresses that goal. And the rest of the story of the Old Testament is in many ways about the people failing to reach that goal. 
So when Jesus, in the context of the synagogue, in the context of the teaching of the law, when he silences and dismisses this demon, he shows that he is not only explaining the goal of the law, he is accomplishing that goal. To teach with authority is not just to have the most information. It is not just to have the winning argument for the debate. To teach with the authority is for Jesus to achieve what the law demanded. It is for him to accomplish the ideal that the law expresses. And Jesus shows this authority, not just with his teaching, not just with his words, but with his actions as well. When he heals and makes clean this leper, notice that he touches him. Which means that he is coming into contact with a contagious person. And not just a contagious disease, but this man was also ritually contagious. To touch an unclean person was to become unclean. But Jesus has the authority to reverse the direction of that contagion. Jesus is not made unclean, but he has the authority to make clean, to restore this man as belonging to the people of God. And that's how the kingdom comes. The kingdom comes by the king expressing this kind of authority. The kingdom comes by the king demonstrating and enacting not only the authority to command, but the authority to accomplish, to bring about the ideals and the goal of God's kingdom, of God's rule. But Jesus doesn't just do that with his teaching of the law and casting out demons and healing of diseases. And that's why when he gets really popular in Capernaum, he moves on. It's why he tells this leper to keep what has happened to him quiet. It's why Jesus throughout this gospel will show his authority and then obscure it. It's because all of these actions, teaching, the exorcisms, the healing, all of these actions weren't the full expression of Jesus' kingdom bringing authority. Instead, they were hints of what was to come. They are previews of coming attractions. They are signs that point towards and help us to understand the full expression of the authority of Jesus as he comes to the city of Jerusalem, dies on on the cross, rises from the dead, and ascends into heaven. That is how the kingdom comes. That is how Jesus, the king, fully expresses, demonstrates, and enacts his authority. Because yes, he can teach the law, but through the cross and the resurrection, he makes possible for people to be forgiven and made new. Yes, he can temporarily heal someone from a sickness, but through the cross and the resurrection, he defeats the power of death and gives the promise of a full resurrection. Yes, he can free some individuals from spiritual oppression, but through the cross and resurrection, the book of Colossians says that he has disarmed the powers and principalities. He has fully shattered the power of Satan over our lives and world. And that is how the kingdom comes. It comes through Jesus, the king, demonstrating his power, expressing his authority through the cross and the resurrection. And as he ascends to heaven to rule over us even now. That's how his kingdom comes, but how does it come into our lives? How does it affect today and tomorrow and the rest of this week? Well, notice that from the very start, Jesus says not only that the kingdom is at hand, but also repent and believe. 
Here is how you respond to the presence of the kingdom in Jesus. Repent and believe. Drop your claim to self-sovereignty. Break those other allegiance and give your life, open your life, surrender your life to the exercise of this authority. Open your life to the word of God Jesus' kingdom bringing work. Allow his word and his presence and his work to define who you are and how you live. And if you will, he will begin to fish you out of the chaos and place you on dry ground and make of you something good and useful, and not only that, Jesus not only does that for us, but he begins to do that through us. Do you remember how it started? Not with teaching and healing, but Jesus gathering a community and saying, Walnut Creek, I will make you fishers of men. You will not only receive the benefits of what I have done, but you will become a part of what I am doing. You will play that role in the lives of each other and the lives of others, of God's rule drawing people out of what disintegrates them, what destroys them and bringing them into the realm of life in Jesus. I've been reading a book called Three Shades of Blue, and it traces the history of how the best-selling jazz album of all time, Miles Davis's Kind of Blue, how that album was made. And it talks about how that album came about as the result of a major change in the history of jazz music. In the early and mid-40s, something significantly changed about that music. Uh, jazz began as music for dancing. Right? That's, that's how the, that kind of music started, but with the emergence of a style called bebop. So people like Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker, with the emergence of that style, the music became so complex that James Kaplan, who wrote this book, says that in the clubs, people stopped dancing and started listening. Now that led to some great music, but something significant was lost in that change. And what Jesus says to us when he says, I will make you fishers of men, is he's saying he doesn't play that kind of jazz music. He plays a music that is infinitely worth listening to, but it is also worth dancing to. It is a music that enters our life and not only rescues us, but makes us ministers of rescue to others. It is a music that come and comes and moves us towards others so that we can be a part of God's kingdom work in their lives as well. So that's why we keep reading. We keep reading not just because we wonder what will happen. We keep reading and hearing the gospel because we see in it why and how the kingdom of God comes. But not only that, we keep reading and listening to the gospel because in the arrival of the kingdom, we become a part of that kingdom continuing to arrive. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for Jesus' announcement. We are so grateful that he said the kingdom is at hand. Would you help us to know our need for that? Would you help us to realize that in our claims to self-sovereignty, in our attempts to rescue and to manage and to control our own lives and world, we continue to float and drown in the chaos. But you have come to rescue us. Your rule has come to fish us out.
and to restore us and even more to expand who we are and can be as those who are a part of your kingdom. Would you help us anew to repent and believe this morning? Would you help us to open ourselves, to entrust ourselves to what Jesus has said, to what he has done? And then would you draw us into that movement? Would you draw us into that dancing that brings the good news of your kingdom to this world? We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.